Hello and welcome to the Tour de France podcast, humansevent.com. My name is Richard Moore. I am joined tonight by Lionel Burney. Good evening, Richard. And Daniel Freib. Hi, Richard. Speak up, Daniel. I'm worried about what, what we're going to talk about today, guys. I'm really uneventful stage, uh, but we'll, we'll crack on with that in a minute. Lionel, can you just uh, describe where we are, which isn't quite as nice as where we were a couple of minutes ago? No, we were sat outside on a nice grassy bank in the sunshine, um, just outside the, I think it's the Parc des es- Expositions, isn't it? We? Oui. Uh, here in... Uh, now it's a bit like a provincial nightclub where we are, isn't it? We're, we're in the sort of, mm. we're next to the cloakroom in the, in the inside of the building. Um, they must have clubs like this in Watford. I There's lots of neon know. light yeah. here. But it's too windy out there, basically. It's too windy um, out there. Now, Daniel, memories of this press room, particularly vivid ah, memories of this press room, 2008. There was a bit of a tussle, wasn't there? Oh, yes. Do you want to tell the story, Rich? Well, it was the yeah. final time trial of the 2008 tour still all to play for. Carlos Sastry was in contention. He was in the yellow jersey. Did you check this, by the way? Yes. Okay, good. And, um, no, but I remember it very clearly. And uh, Sastry was, was going for the victory, and his... Some of his teammates were off early, obviously, and they, having what, having done their rides, they came into the press room to watch the uh, how the stage unfolded. They were Stuart O'Grady, Atley, uh, sorry, um, uh, Kurt, Kurt, Kurt Arvison, and it was no, Jens Voigt, just, just the no, two of them. Two. So the two of them came in and sat at the front of the press room watching the TV screens, and all of a sudden I was working. I remember there was a huge commotion. Yeah. And Daniel, can you t- pick up, take up the story? Well, the press chief, or the, the guy who was in charge of the press room back then, was a guy called Mathieu Dipla. Um, he was a fairly... He could be quite muscular, abrasive, couldn't he? Yeah. yeah. We, as, we knew, as we find out a couple of years later. Yeah, probably. oh, that's true, actually. Um, and, yeah, Arvison and O'Grady were minding their own business. This often happens, and I'm not, never quite sure why it happens for the final time. Well, try, try a couple when of you muscular, was he as muscular as Marcel oh, Kitten? God. Um... A riders tend to float into the press room and there's never ever been a problem with it but Rich I've got a notion that this was the tour when um, there were rumours of Brian Nygaard um, the CSC press officer compiling dossiers on the press and having some kind of mm. um, written blacklist Right. Um, and I think Gilles Laroque who's another journalist from Reuters had made some kind of complaint about this mm. anyway they were sitting there minding their own business watching the race Mattia um, sort of st- st- stalked over and he basically manhandled them, didn't he? It, mm. it was very provincial out. nightclub-esque, wasn't it? <laughs> out. Get out. And um, he literally wrestled them out, didn't he? he? He literally did. And there was a slang match across the press room. Yeah, they were shouting and, and he said, we don't, we don't come on your bus. So you can't come in our so press room. you can't room. come in our press room. It was wonderful. I didn't know Matthew was Glaswegian. <laughs> yes. He was, yes, he was putting on a Glaswegian <laughs> accent in order to sound a bit tougher. Yeah. Anyway, let's crack on with the show. You're listening to the Tour de France podcast with humansinvent.com and Sharp. What a stage. What a stage. Stage 13, yeah. Unlucky for some. What, what happened today, Daniel? That's the a, race, that's a the bit race. of a cop-out race. No, what the, happened? OK, well, the, the race split into lots of different echelons. We don't often see that. I think uh, Omega Farm, a quick step, were the first instigators of that, as I understand it, 63 kilometres into the race. There were 110, 110 still to 10 go. To get, yeah. And um, they, they, Gert Cavendish, Mark Cavendish, the stage winner, uh, told us afterwards that Gert Stiegmans, he said there wasn't a plan, but that Stiegmans I, said to him, it's windy, uh, you know, be ready. I've heard that's uh, not true, uh, that there was a plan, um, and it was discussed last night in the hotel where Belkin and Omega Pharma Quickstep were staying yeah. and it was decided last night that in the right conditions something would happen um, and those two teams would collaborate. Right, Bel- Belkin had scouted this stage out back in May, I gather. So uh, they, they, were, they were aware that it, if, yeah. if the wind blew... that uh, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because a Belgian and a Dutch team and this is the sort of racing that is synonymous with those countries. What's interesting too is that... Um, you know, Belkin are the old Rabobank team who were always very good in these kind of conditions. Mm. And this is a this is typical sort of first stage, second stage of Paris-Nice type terrain. I mean, it's really is the breadbasket of France. It's it's not very inspiring. 
um, in terms of scenery, but there is often wind. And what was interesting about today as well is that it really didn't seem windy. I remember we passed a wind farm on the motorway, and it wasn't the um, propellers weren't moving at all. And at the finish, it was there turned was off. well, at the, at the finish, um, there wasn't a lot of, of wind either. Um, maybe fifteen, I think fifteen kilometers an hour. Yeah. So I mean, but it must. It must well, was it, so was it just uh, th- those teams also just drilled it? I mean, I we we got a better view of the second split that occurred. Well, the first split, let's go back to that, because that saw Valverde and, and Movistar out the back, as well as Kittel, which was quite a surprise. Mm. Well, Valverde had had a problem, hadn't he? Rear wheel puncture, was it? Did um, he puncture? No, I thought he punctured after the split, and then they, were, they were close to getting back on right, when he punctured. Belkin were, Belkin were really turning Drilling the screw it, at that yeah. point, and um, there was a bit of discussion afterwards. Mick Rogers of Saxo um, said that they didn't feel it was appropriate to put the hammer yeah. down at that point because Valverde second overall was off the back um, and Chris uh, Room said something quite similar and, and so and, and, and other teams uh, and we can only assume Belkin was one of them but other teams apparently tried to enlist a bit of help and Saxo said no we're not going to join in at the moment um, but Belkin you know they uh, there's a well um, Balka Molimo I think I saw a comment where he said uh, made a comment um, that you know Valverde hasn't necessarily been uh, particularly sportsmanlike in the past, and um, they had no qualms By about. By doping, do you mean? But well, you know, very possibly, yeah. But also, you know, um, uh, look, think back to Paris Nice last year when Movistar um, turned the screw on Lifeheimer riding for Amiga Farm, a quick step, I think. Yeah. Um, when he had a problem, and Movistar, they they had no qualms then um, to put. Life armor out of the overall picture in that race, and so what goes round comes round. And at the end of the day, the opportunity to put Valverde out of the race. Well, what I'd like to know. I mean, obviously, this plan that was hatched, Omega Farmer. Omega Farmer would have been thinking of a stage win for Cavendish. Um, Belkin would have been thinking of their two men for the overall Malema and Tendam. But that would only have been worth doing if they had been able to eliminate people. Who do you think they had in mind? Was it Valverde? Was it perhaps Froome? I think in these situations, you just take what you get I don't think there was any necessarily any concerted plan unless at that point they'd looked back and seen that Valverde was um, was a long way back but I think some people will have been taken by surprise today I understand there was a lot of talk in the peloton or in the among teams yesterday about the possibility of um, crosswinds without going into too much detail but detail but I'm about to um, Philippe Mordi of the Saxo Bank team, um, their director sportif is from Tour, and there was a spot on the route yesterday which was apparently ideal, or it was thought that it was going to be ideal for crosswinds. But the council recently planted a row of trees along that road, and so therefore it's no longer particularly windy. And the, the, the lack knowledge. of the lack of echelons Those yesterday. Those trees weren't planted by Movistar. <laughs> the <laughs> lack of echelons yesterday supposedly hinged on. The trees. The trees, wow. yeah. Bay trees, I think they might have been. Is it from there? What, what are the trees? The, the, the kind of quintessential Tour de France, um, you know, France profonde, trees. tree-lined road. Um, I, I forget what, I'm no arborist. Not pop- arborist. poplars? No. I'm not sure then. No. I'm not sure then. No. I know, I know, I could draw you one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No good for a is. podcast. Anyway, final. it was them. <laughs> Yeah, well, it so, was. So, it, sorry, it's great should, racing, isn't it? Should just say, I mean, yeah. Valverde's lost nine minutes fifty-four mm. to the Contador Group, mm. um, completely out of the race. I mean, mm-hmm. once they were off the back, um, they they chased, they chased pretty hard, but they weren't getting an awful lot of help. Were they? they were they were on their own. Fortunately, they had uh, fortunately they had Quintana in the front group at that stage. So, um, you know, Valverde he wasn't left without help, but in that wind, the, there was just no way they could close the gap and once they kind of eased off a bit the, the, the time gap just went interesting we saw movie start the start this morning mucking about weren't they they were they went went to sign on on mass and they were really they were like little schoolboys they were they were riding back kind of hitting each other oh, yeah. um, rubbing wheels knocking each other's handlebars as though they were sort of it's just an interesting little observation they were they were being very jovial they what, were very good what spirits tinkers. what tinkers um but you know, meanwhile, Belkin and Omega Farmer are 
hunched over a map in the in the in the in the, in the team bus, grunting the, like the old days Dutch. of yeah. in the old days of you know Cyril Guimar and you know Morris Demure and these directors who would look at, get the map out and and you know have the day yeah. planned out. Um, that it was it was very much that that kind of stage, wasn't it? Old old school. We haven't seen that for for a long time. No. One person suggested two thousand and nine, the stage in the Camargue, mm. but it, it wasn't as dramatic it was as that. And it was telegraphed. Everyone knew that it was yeah. going to split. And this first split came. It was thirty kilometres yeah. or so from the end. I actually saw a stage at the Tour de l'Avenir in two thousand and nine, which I think might have finished here, even though it was very very close to here. Again, similar, um, very similar scenario. Just totally nondescript terrain, very very flat. It's not. I don't think it's known particularly as a windy area of France. I think the, the winds here are just it fairly is, no. sort of, um, you know, moderate. And that race completely split apart again due to crosswinds. Perhaps you don't need, uh, you know, a really strong wind. No. Perhaps you just need a really committed team. And if they're in, riding in the gutter, and really drilling it. Yeah. Um, if guys, it, you know, the peloton will be in one long line there. They'll all be looking mm. for shelter. Mark Cavendish came up with a brilliant description afterwards um, about, you know, it's like falling, riding an echelon is like falling through ice. You've got about five seconds to rectify a situation um, once you realise what's happening. Yeah. Well, and Mark, have you planted that one, Daniel? No, Mark, but how do, you fall, how do you rectify the situation if you're falling through ice? Well, no, if you start to realise that the ice is cracking, you've got about five oh, okay. seconds to save very yourself. Good, you've got five oh, seconds wow. to save yourself. Sorry, I didn't, he expressed it better than I did. But um, it, it's absolutely true. If you And he described today just what happened. He was the last man onto the group. And, it, you know, that when you look up and you see two or three riders in front of you losing the wheel in front, you have... It's, it's game over. And so, you know, Chris Froome being losing out there and being stuck in that same group, it wouldn't have been his own fault in a sense. It would just be purely because he wasn't well, close enough mm, to the front. Yeah, and unless... Um, do, do we know who it was that, that caused the gap, who was gap there? I mean, you could, there's also ways to do it strategically, aren't there? It could have been, um, you know, a Belkin rider or a Sassabank Yeah, absolutely. Rider. That, that, that is another way to do it, yeah. I'm not sure. Just... Uh, Talking about echelons, last week when we were expecting the wind to blow down in uh, Provence and into the, the Longue, yeah. we spoke to Andreas Clear of Garmin Sharp about that. And if people want to listen to what he said, he gave a bit of an echelon riding masterclass. I think that's in stage five, I think. Possibly, yeah. Uh, um, either stage four or stage five. Worth a listen. Mm. This is the humansinvent.com Tour de France podcast, powered by Sharp. Let's talk about Sky, because we've got an interview coming up with Service Canavan, their sports director, a Belgian who's used to these conditions. Dutchman. Sorry, Dutchman. I'm always, I always do you that. You always do that. I always, I've got Rich, a real, where's the listing by name Yeah, from? No, I've got a real problem with Dutch <laughs> and Belgian. I, yeah, <laughs> sorry. That's sorry, Servas. <laughs> I do apologise. But yeah, Sky, I mean, Chris Froome, what a torrid time he's having, really. I mean, he lost Edvald Bosenhagen yesterday to... A broken shoulder blade. That you know, he's out of the race, and he might have been a useful ally today. Kirienka might have been a useful ally today, but he was eliminated at the weekend. Are we I, sure that it was a bad day for them? Because I'm not convinced. You're not. Not really, because you know, in the same way that Movistar took away the option for Sky of of using Froome and um, Paul alternating them, then Movistar no longer have the option of using Quintana and Valverde. So, uh, you know, was that not more of a threat than Contador on his own or I, Wallemar on his I, own? I, I, I mean, think I think it's less the time and those scenarios and more the the, the the lack of confidence he must have in his team because mm. when the chips were down, his team once again went AWOL and he he does he did look incredibly isolated. There was a, a point today where AG2R were chasing on the front. Mm. And Froome had, didn't have a teammate around him anywhere. Stannard had been at the front. He'd disappeared to the back. Garen Thomas finally appeared, and those two put in a couple of uh, decent shifts towards the end. But he did look incredibly isolated once again. Is it too early to say that Sky got the selection wrong in this Tour de France? I mean, would, would that have happened today if Christian Knies had been there, if um, Bernard Eisler had been there? Michael Rogers. Michael. Rogers. Not that they could have selected him. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's a good question. They, they did pretty well to, to hold it, limit the losses. Once the gap had gone, um, it was about that really, wasn't it? Mm. Making sure that, that it didn't go from a minute to two minutes, which it could quite easily have done if, yeah. if Froome had been even more isolated. Um, but they never had the numbers that 
that Saxo had in the front group. And so it's a, it's a, it's a pure um, game of numbers at that point. If you've got five committed riders in the front group and only, only three or three and a half in the chasing group, then the, the advantage is with the front group, of course. Rich, I think we, I mean, we all talked when the team was announced about the lack of it, it wasn't really a lack of experience as such because there are a lot of there are a lot of tours de France combined tours de France in that team in the personnel. Not that but it many was the, actually. Well, a fair number, but it was mm. it was more the lack of um, a, a kind of talismanic man, yeah. manic figure to sort of take control in difficult situations. And um, you know, we all know the guys who they don't just have a stature in their own team, but also in the peloton and in terms of talking to other teams, making agreements with other teams, etc, etc. Eisel is certainly one of those guys. And, you know, you look at the Sky team, OK, they've got a fairly, fairly impressive pedigree, but I just always felt that they lacked someone like that, like a Michael Rogers yeah. or an Eisel. Yeah. L- Lopez is a mystery to me. Lopez yeah. and Seitsu is clearly just not in form. He's been a, and he's very a, quiet. a strong very, rider, very quiet. a strong rider in the past, but he's just not in form. Well, Lopez, when he had such a bad time trial, second or third, second or third last, I think, um, I thought maybe is he saving himself for not necessarily stages like this, but stages when we you know when we get into the, into the mountains. But he just doesn't look like he's he's got it. And Daniel, the point you make there about Mick Rogers, very valid because he was pretty much instrumental in making the the Saxo led move that that distance through. Mm. He he said that him and Daniele Bernati gave each other a look. They didn't say anything to each other, but they just knew that this was the moment to go. And they went to the front, and they were the ones that kind of caused the split. And, and they had willing um, cooperation from Belkin, and, and, and Sky very definitely didn't have that. They're not on the, they're not, they don't look like a group that are all on that same wavelength where things can happen without necessarily having to, to communicate you know, verbally and shout and, and, and get things organised. Saxo just did it kind of almost and look automatically at, and look at the, the experience they have in that team you know you talk about guys like Bernati Roach I mean Roach is you know it's quite a young rider still but Tosato these are guys with 15 grand tours um, maybe 20 in some cases you know yeah I mean you mentioned the experience of Sky I think most experienced Sky rider has only ridden three tours right. you know it's Sitsu uh, Lopez maybe two Garen Thomas three you know so it, it's not a super experienced team and they are they are missing as you say those talismans I think we can hear now from Service Canav and Daniel you spoke to him after the stage here is uh, Team Sky's Belgian or Dutch uh, sports director it's hardly any wind here um, well it feels like there's hardly no. any wind um, uh, go on the bike yeah yeah we'd said it was going to be a very straightforward stage did you expect any of that at all today Yesterday we expected it a little bit. Right. Uh, we, we were aware. Today we were aware. It always can happen. It can always happen. Right. And uh, so when there's one team who wants to do it, yeah, we can do it. And today Quickstep had the plan, and they, they went for it. Yeah, that, that made the race really tough. In the second split, when Chris was left behind, had the team switched off a little bit there? Did they think that was it know. for the I don't know. split? I don't know. You have to ask the riders. I was in the second car behind uh, the drop rider, so I. Right. Don't give an answer on that. Okay. Just a, as far as the team is concerned, um, you've lost to Edvald. You've again. It's been a difficult day today. Are you worried about in the next few days and the strength of the team in? As well? Yeah. We, 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 everybody forgets maybe that we had seven guys in the first group, so they were all there. Some of the seven are not really uh, specialists in yeah. crosswinds, so but they were there. The team was there, and uh, so I think many others were already dropped. So. Uh, I don't think uh, we are not worried about uh, the team's uh, capabilities, but if you see the breakaway at the end with, with seven, I think seven Saxo mm-hmm. and you're really going for it, yeah, then if you have only a few left behind in the peloton, then it's hard. Yeah. And that, but that's pretty normal, and uh, so, uh, but uh, we are not worried. Okay. But of course, a minute is a minute. This is a humansinvent.com Tour de France podcast with Richard Moore, Daniel Freib and Lionel Burney. Okay, here we are in the breadbasket of France and the stage winner today, that was the other story today, Mark Cavendish bounced back from uh, 
his you know, couple of disappointments and his treatment on Wednesday during the time trial. Yeah, sorry, Just Daniel. a short interlude. Talking of bread, Rich, um, mm. what did you make of the buffet today? Because we've been when we've been here in the past, it has been um, it's been similar to what it was today. They just basically they kill a cow and they haul it into the car park. I didn't make it. And and spit roast. I didn't. I, I didn't make it to the buffet. Right. Was it? Was it, it was good? It's just a cow, a dead cow. Oh, being I'm really sorry. I was really. I was. I was. Open. Unfortunately, was it, was it, it was quite harrowing. I was otherwise actually. engaged. I was otherwise engaged at the time. I stupidly and I missed. A, a, Chunk of the racing because yeah, I stupidly, a a cow well. I stupidly agreed to um, give an interview steak. today to the makers of a uh, forthcoming uh, documentary was, film about Paul Kimmage called Rough Rider. So I gave a forty-eight minute interview to them in which I discussed the enigma that is Paul Kimmage, and that was enjoyable. I said about that the best, and, and you missed you missed the best stage of the There's tour some of kind of karma in that. I yeah. think. some something. <laughs> Some moral in that story. A stage for the ages, and, and you, you. Well, I was it. reminiscing fondly about Paul Kimmage. Well, should we, should we talk? Anyway, um, I th- I thought the, the, the way the, the way that Amiga Farmer Quickstep carved up the finish was impressive. With uh, like that, they carved it up like they carved up that cow earlier. Brilliant. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Brilliant. It was, uh, it was good though, wasn't it? With uh, Nicky Terpstra making the oh yeah, that was the, good. the initial move, forcing. Clever. Um, Bodnar. Yeah. Was it Very Bodnar clever. from Cannondale yeah, to, yeah. to make the counter? Putting uh, Peter Sargon onto the back foot a little bit. Then they still had Sylvain Chavanel, Amiga Farmer, to give Cav the lead out. Um, you know, a, a kind of lead out light, really, wasn't it? But it was still it was yeah. still more than enough. And then and then Cavendish had plenty of uh, plenty of speed to keep yeah. Sag- it, it was off. it was a great team effort and interestingly just remembering back to what Kim, uh, <laughs> Cavendish said um, the Kwiatowski is that how you pronounce him? Yeah. Kwiatowski the, his Polish young Polish teammate who's still in the white jersey yeah. um, he I think he sacrificed himself to allow Cavendish to get in that front echelon yeah. I think he was just in front of Cavendish and there were a couple of it was just a couple of wheels up that uh, the, the, the gap was opening and, and he I don't know if he gave him a hand sling or, or something, but he helped him become the last man in the echelon. So he sacrificed himself, lost a minute there. And it, it was a fantastic team effort to have three men there as opposed to Cannondale's two. The attack by, attack by Terpster with a kilometre to go was, was genius, wasn't it, really? Yeah, it was very good. And, and um, Cavendish is, is outstanding in these situations in crosswinds. And I spoke to Fabrizio Guidi at the finish line. He's a direct sportif for Saxo Bank, and he... You know, talked about the importance of motivation in these stages, and he said they've been drumming it into their riders for for three days now that these two stages, you know, something could happen, and they had to be up for it. And you can just tell that Cavendish just he relishes these stages so I mean, much, and yeah. that and that really translates into you know fantastic positioning, um, the ability to really grit his teeth and. and Close gaps when they do open. But those, I, I mean, he said he made a bigger effort to get onto that the, in, into the echelon than he did in the final sprint. More, he put out more watts for that effort. Mm. I mean, we talk about Cavendish as the greatest sprinter of all time, but stages like today show what a brilliant all-round bike rider is. What great racing instinct he has. Um, his positioning is excellent. His, his ability to read a race and and just the physical ability to be in that group. You know, when you look at some of the, the people left behind. Touching on what Daniel said, it's a desire, really. I mean, you know, he's, he's had a bit of an up-and-down tour, hasn't he? I mean, it's been kind of good day, bad day for him. But if he hadn't won today, it's a, it's a long old week and a bit to the next sprint opportunity, which is on the Champs-Élysées in, in Paris on the last day. So um, it wasn't a case of the tour turning into a bit of a... Um, uh, a, not a disaster for Cavendish had he not won today, but he now gives himself a great chance. You know, it's almost like propelling him into the mountain stage. It's going to be tough for him to to slog his way through with, with the carrot. a possibility for him as well. A second second category, too no. close to the finish. I no, think yeah, maybe okay. too much. And I think if Saxo and Movistar mm. and, and, one of, and Belkin are, are, yeah. are, are looking keen, I, I can't see that being a, a sprint for him. But yeah. It's a long way to Paris. It is. For so, him. I mean, it's a long way for the last sprint stage. It is, and 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 that's really all he's got. Yeah. Um, Four years to in motivate a row. him. He's won there. Really. Just going back to um, his ability and his desire in Estlans, you know, if, if someone had told us 
that there was going to be a group of 15 or 20 today and it was, was going to go away, probably the first name you would have written down would have been Mark Cavendish. What's amazing is that guys like Greipel, you know, such a big, strong, powerful rider, misses it, Kittel misses it. You know, and these other sprinters who should theoretically be also very good in these conditions. Well, Kittel missed the first one, didn't yeah, he? he? Because he was in the Valverde yeah, group. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, that was that was a bit of a surprise. I mean, yeah. he's he's seven foot four of, of German yeah. condensed muscle. German <laughs> beef he's, cake, he's, beef he's, again. He's, uh, you know, he's he's adding four inches every day. I don't think um, there were any lotto riders, you know, in that front group at all. No, and they didn't aid the. They didn't no. do anything on the on the second group. They no. left um, they left all of that to Sky. So whether whether they were thinking Sky will bring this back and we will be fresh and and we will outwit. Omega Pharma in the, in the front group. I don't know, but it was odd that they didn't commit any resources to just even a, even a man or two might have. Yeah, that word commitment line. Rod Ellingworth, uh, Mark Cavendish's old coach, and now at Team Sky said at the the finish that that was the great thing about Cavendish and Omega Pharma. Said they were so committed, and he contrasted that with Lotto Bellisol that they, you know, they they were hedging their bets. You know, was it going to come back? Was it not? Instead of saying right, we're going to take control of this and we're going to make sure it comes back. Well, I spoke yesterday, actually, to Franz Massen, the sports director of um, the Belkin team. He's definitely Dutch. Uh, used to be... Well, a, I, in a piece a few years ago, I read that he was a swan, yeah. I didn't... I, oh, yeah. that's much worse. <laughs> that's I, much I was worse. Only, I was only a young lad at the time. Brilliant. <laughs> you didn't know that he was, he'd, he'd been in one of the most amazing no, breaks. No, I was totally just starting out. He was a very good rider, wasn't he? Did he, he not ruin the, that um, World Cup race in Newcastle? He did, the Wing Canton Classic. The Wing Canton Classic. Gray Street, yeah. yeah. He I rode was, for I Buckler, was, Super Confex, yeah. all these teams. I was on Grey Street that day. I think Sean Kelly was third. I think you might be right. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, was it was 1989. 1989. Woo! Lionel, high five. Um, so anyway, Franz Masson, I had a, I had a <laughs> sorry about that. I had a Daniel chat. Daniel was only eight at the time. I Daniel, know. yeah, um, yeah, he must have been eight. a young boy. Anyway, carry on. You were beating Justin Rose at the time, yeah, I think. Probably. Well, four that. years later. Okay, anyway, sorry. Go we can talk about that another day. Yeah, we will. Um, so anyway, I had a chat, brief chat with Franz Masson, and it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't about crosswinds or anything like that. It was about the team, they've got two riders, Tendam and, and Malema, who are both very well placed and even better placed now um, to, to mount an assault in the, in the mountains next week. Second and, also, second and fifth. Se- second and fifth, second yeah, very, and fifth, very good. Yeah. And he said what, what a surprise that was even to them and, and talked about their prospects next week and also about the fact that the team, uh, formerly Rabobank, has a new sponsor. You're having a great Tour de France. Two riders in Malema did a, a very good ride yesterday. Um, you must be happy with how things have been going so far. Yeah, it's, uh, also for us a little surprise. You hope all that he can do what he proves now, but uh, you never know. And uh, there are a lot of riders, say, for example, the guys like Brajkovic, Kunigo, a lot of these guys, uh, Jürgen van der Broek, they are all at the same level like Bauke and Tendam. Mm. But now it's a little bit an hour advantage still now, and yeah, you hope you hope they can prove it in in, in, uh, in the most important race in the year. But uh, which which, which is the greater surprise, uh, Malem or Tendam? It's the same. Uh, last year uh, was already Tendam was eight in the Vuelta and a very difficult Vuelta, and now we we try to to give him some help uh, the first week, and we saw that he was in a good condition, and uh, also with. With different uh, way in going to the race with uh, Gesink, we could could give another rider a little bit more help to stay in the GC. But uh, still surprised that they, after 11 days, still uh, three and six first. Mm. What well, what do you do with two riders in the in the top six? Do you try and uh, finish one of them on the podium, or do you do you, are you prepared to sort of sacrifice one to try and help the other one? Um, yeah, we 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 see it day by day because uh, even today it looks like a pretty easy stage. It's long, but uh, not not that difficult. But uh, last year we were also in a good position, and the most easiest uh, day in the tour, we crashed 14 times, and all the tour was over for us. And uh, it was really a really easy stage. That there was the big crash you remember with uh, the, mm. the big crash just mm. before the finish. So uh, you can always lose the tour in, in a split moment. And uh, of course, uh, Froom is now in a good position, but still uh, we are only halfway. And we saw it with Port. 
one day, one bad day, and everything is over. It is from beatable, do you think? Yeah, I think so. It's not uh, the same team. Uh, of course, he's the best rider in the in the tour by far, maybe. But still, uh, he 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 needs a, a great team, and he has a great team. But it is uh, less, a little bit less strong than last year. And uh, there will be attacks on his position. So if you had a situation where you had your two men, Tendam and, and Malema, with Froome, uh, would would it? be possible for them to take turns attacking him? Yeah, for for this moment we we survived the, the next three stages and then we have the big stage to the moment too and after that we we know really what what's uh, what's possible and there we uh, we see in the rest day our last uh, week strategy so for the moment is to keep the positions and do a good moment too. You have a new sponsor, which uh, you, you confirmed on the eve of the tour. Um, what, what kind of difference does that make to the riders, knowing that there's some stability, they're able to look into the future no, a little that, bit more? No, no, of course, that was really important, because uh, you know, after the stop of uh, Rabobank, um, there was uh, for us the chance that it would uh, stop uh, with uh, all the team. And, uh, now with the new sponsor and the new colours and everything, it gave a boost, and uh, of course... This boost is even bigger when uh, our chief of the team uh, is in the third position in the tour. And, uh, it was a long time ago that that we could do with two Dutch guys four and five in a uh, difficult Pyrenees stage. So that gives us uh, a big boost. The Tour de France with humansinvent.com. Innovation, craftsmanship, and design. So here we are, the Tour de France podcast with humansevent.com and we have just a few more items of business, one of them being a new competition and this is to win a phone call from Jonathan Vauters, general manager at Garmin Sharp, chief executive. I think that would be a very long phone call. It could be a very long phone call. Cancel all of the plans that day. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) He does like to talk. So he's going to call somebody on the rest day. Our competition last week to win a phone call from David Miller attracted lots of entries and it was a great success. Jen's lo- Jen loves cycling, certainly enjoyed her conversation with David Miller. So one of you will be receiving a call from Jonathan Vauters on Monday. If you, again, would just hashtag tour moment, uh, send a tweet with hashtag tour moment with some of your favourite memories, it can be anything at all, and we'll select a winner. Um, please don't select the famous wasp sting that uh, Jonathan Vauters suffered in 2001, was it? Um, or you can if you like. Might not pick it though. It's like the quirkier the better uh, for your tour memories. Hashtag tour moment. Um, now it's over to Chiro. And now Pedaler du Charme. Thank you, Chiro, our Italian friend from Gazetta della Sport, who will join us again imminently, uh, as will Tan Man, I'm sure, who joined us last night. So, Pedaler du Charme, I have a nomination today. Mm. Go for it. Um, it's uh, never thought, I never thought I, I would say this, but Cadell Evans. Oh, this morning, I, oh. wit- I witnessed at the start, I witnessed him riding towards the start with his helmet on his handlebars, wearing a, a cotton team cap. And as he was riding up to the, um, to the start with his bodyguards in tow, as they always are, as one bodyguard, George, he weaved over to the side to an Australian flag, took off his sweaty cotton team cap and handed it to them, which I thought was a very nice gesture. So Pedlar de Charme today for me is Cadell Evans. The Aussies seem to have this bond with their fans, don't they? Yesterday it was Simon Tan Man. Yes, it was Tan Man. Yesterday mm. Tan Man, of course. Uh, maybe it's because uh, the fans have made such a commitment to come... Well, all the way from London. All the way from from All the way from Clapham. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a long way. Can, can I nominate uh, oh, yeah. Nicholas or Nicola Roach or Rock? Nicholas. It, well, it depends on what is he really. Oh, he's Irish. He's Irish. Sounds Irish. Sounds, Irish. Yeah. Um, sounds more Irish. Than yeah. I, he was he was really impressive in the front group um, today. I thought um, he's had a bit of criticism over the years for being one of those riders who seems to be kind of fixated on overall position rather than on um, yes. perhaps winning a stage. 
Uh, he's kind of the anti Dan Martin, if you if you if you mm. like. Um, you know, he will. He, you get the feeling with him that he would much rather finish sort of twelfth or eleventh, or try and claw his way up into the top ten than, than sort of risk everything for a stage win. And so you wouldn't automatically assume that he'd be the sort of person who would empty the tank. Um, for a teammate, but of course, being in the Saxo team with with Contador to ride for, I thought he rode really strongly today. He he looked a little bit, you know, he has, his, his pedalling style isn't dissimilar to his dad's. It's not. What do you think? It's he's not chunkier. He's chunkier, yeah, but the the suplex yeah. of his legs is is not dissimilar. It's not in the same league as, mm. as Stephen Roach, who looked like his his chain wasn't connected up to the chain set and the derailleur. He was that smooth, but. Um, he's my pedaler de charm today. Mm. Yeah, Roach had always sat very back, far back, didn't he? And just very when he was in, in shape, uh, he, he looked great. Daniel, any nominations, pedaler de charm uh, or Solon's charm? I would say Benati today, um, a rider who has really sort of metamorphosed from a sprinter into just he's just a very good ruler. Looks fantastic on the bike, and the saddle looks good as well. I think. Yeah, and Benati's also quite a nice chap. Yeah. Um, I think my, I think I'll, I'll sort of uh, um, reintroduce the inertia prize for today as well and award that not to Alejandro Valverde because you don't expect these Spanish uh, climbers and teams to necessarily uh, thrive in these conditions. But Marcel Kittel, come on, mate, took the, took the day off. I didn't care. That took the day off. Today. Come on. Six foot four of German condensed muscle he may be. Yeah. With a fine head of blonde hair, <laughs> but. Took the day off. Could have had four stage I wins. I don't think he wanted another encounter with Gerard Holtz. I think that's what kept him in the back <laughs> room. Or indeed Daniel Freib. Uh, anyway, that's. I think that we'll, we'll, we'll make it a that's brief one. Up. We'll make it a what brief one tonight. tonight? Rich? We're staying about an hour and a half away, aren't we? Yeah, Lionel. long drive. Who, long who booked drive. this hotel? I, I booked this hotel, but yeah. it is close to tomorrow's start. Okay, we'll let you off then. Until tomorrow. Goodbye, Daniel. Goodbye. Goodbye, Lionel. Well, I'm going to be driving you to your hotel, Richard, so... Oh, you're driving, are you? <laughs> Is it my turn? I think it might be, yeah. yeah. I've got a feature to write on Mont Bon 2. Well, it's me driving this. It's a long way to Mont Bon 2. You've got to write the feature on Mont Bon 2. Or about oh. Mont Bon 2. <laughs>